So perfusion assessment to look at an astomotic uh, healing probability. Anatomic visualization, many structures, including the tumor itself, and all of these things listed on the slide. So let's look at, last time we spoke about perfusion. Let's look at some of the other things. Ureters. Um, ureter identification can be very difficult, particularly in patients in whom there's been prior radiation, uh, prior pelvic sepsis, such as a prior anastomotic leak, prior dissection. Lots of reasons to have uh, pelvic fibrosis, pelvic inflammation that can obscure the ureters and increase the difficulty and, and therefore the danger to, of injury to the ureters during surgery. So, you know, many people rely upon uh, intraoperative ureteric catheters to be able to palpate an open surgery or be able to visualize them in laparoscopic surgery and robotic surgery. But the idea of adding endocyanine green gives another level. And you can see uh, there's a couple of articles in the literature showing the, the problem is, at the present time, we still need to use uh, stents to get the ICG in. So eventually, we're going to come with a marker uh, that uh, does not require uh, stents. But it's safe. Uh, and as these new dyes come online, we'll figure out a way, because ICG is excreted in the liver, which is why it's so useful in, in HPV surgery. Common, duct, common bile duct visualization, liver segments, and the like. But we need something renal excreted. We've looked at a few things along those lines, these two articles. We looked at a, a uh, sodium fluorescein and a near-infrared fluorescent dye, but it's work in progress. There's nothing yet that's been uh, commercially available. You can see these studies are from uh, 10 years ago and, and, again, about six years ago, and, and we, there's nothing yet commercially available. But you can also see the ureter is brilliantly glowing here. It's very, very easy to see, even in a scarred, uh, inflamed uh, rectum. Now, a couple of others have taken this concept <laughs> a bit more distal in the urinary tract, and uh, Roel Humpus uh, uh, and, uh, for, for, and uh, Chris Cunningham from Oxford, they looked at the urethra because when people started doing uh, as you may remember, transanal total nasal excision, there were some urethral injuries. And people thought it might be good to be able to put fluorescein around the catheter, the bladder catheter, and visualize the urethra. So that's another possible use. Um, and uh, it's been done in other studies as well. Michele Diana uh, as well from IRCAD has done it as well. Few people have used it. Uh, the Japanese have used it to help prevent injury. The third area is nerve identification. And although nerves can be visualized, again, like ureteric visualization without stents, without catheters, it, it's still a work in progress. It's, it's not ready for prime. Tumor localization is being used in many places, however. Uh, and you can see that the... There's small numbers in most of these studies, and there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of how the injection is done, where it's done, whether it's one point distal to the tumor, four points distal to the tumor in the tumor, as well as when it's done. Is it something that's done prior to surgery, a couple of days? Is it something done during surgery? One of the most intriguing, I think, is this recent one with fluorescent clip marking, just like you might put other clips around the lesion. You have ICG-coated clips. And that may be a way for us to visualize the lesion without needing to do intraoperative colonoscopy. Lymph node identification and, and lymph node mapping is another key one. And, and although, for example, for an anterior section, a colloidal anastomosis, any kind of a proctectomy, we're going to perform a high ligation uh, near the aorta. So it doesn't change. But when we're looking at something like a right hemicolectomy, particularly a hepatic flexure lesion, a mid-transverse colon lesion, a splenic flexure lesion. Um, there are a lot of variations in how that surgery be done. For the hepatic flexure lesion, are you doing an extended right hemicolectomy? Are you doing a subtotal for a splenic flexure lesion or segmental? So, be, <laughs> excuse me. so being able to identify the lymph nodes and map them is, is key. 
And you can see, again, ICG has been used to map nodes in a lot of different settings, anywhere from stage 1 to stage 4 lesion, T1 to T4 lesion, small numbers. But again, like the mapping of the, um, uh, of, of um, uh, uh, sorry, like the use in ureters and like the use in urethras, there's a lot of heterogeneity in how it's done. A lot of heterogeneity. So is it done laparoscopically? Is it done endoscopically in other words if you inject around the tumor like um is done for sentinel nodes of the breast right it's gonna the dye is gonna travel so you inject around the tumor colonoscopically and now the high lymph glands are gonna light up um the way it may be done with lymphazurin or something like that some people have done it ex vivo in the specimen after the specimen's out which i don't think is nearly as helpful as doing it uh, in vivo, either prior to or during surgery. The doses have varied. You can see here, one point, uh, here's four quadrants, two quadrants, all over the map. What seems to be agreed upon, with the exception of this Anderson study, uh, is that the detection rate is anywhere 90 to 100 percent. The sensitivity, though, isn't great, so we'll probably keep getting better. Uh, Antonio Lacey uh, and his group did a, uh, a meta-analysis. They found 11 studies and found an overall detection of 91% um, of the nodes, period, but of metastatic nodes, again, about two out of three. So it's, it's not ideal. Um, it's promising in early lesions, though, and that's one where it may be very, very helpful. And you can see here's an example where with white light, you may not really see these lymph glands. And then as you put on the ICG, you appreciate, you know, there's actually a lymph node right in here. It may not be readily visualized with white light to the naked eye. Pelvic sidewall nodes, that's one where really I think there's a huge amount of promise because right now there's a lot of debate about whether or not to dissect the lateral pelvic nodes when performing rectal cancer surgery. The Japanese might routinely do it uh, with their BMI 18 patients. With our BMI 38 patients, there's a lot of morbidity. We wouldn't necessarily automatically do it, but there are scenarios where we might want to. Scenario where you have um, a, a positive node on an MRI or several positive nodes along the internal uh, iliacs, uh, the pelvic sidewalls, a couple of nodes positive on MRI or on CT, you give chemo, maybe the nodes aren't gone, or they are gone, but you know they used to be positive. Do you dissect them or not? And that's where fluorescence may come in, being able to light up the pelvic sidewall. And you can see that ICG resulted in less blood loss, perhaps because of a more targeted dissection, larger number of lateral pelvic lymph nodes harvested by about an additional 50%, and no difference in operative time or conversion or complication or length of stay. The lateral pelvic nodes here in this study, again, more nodes, less blood loss, shorter length of stay, um, and successful identification. So there's a lot to be said for it. Uh, this is a retrospective multi-institutional study out of Japan. A propensity score matched 152 uh, sorry, 172 patients, 58 in each group. Like we saw in the other studies, less blood loss, more nodes. Did take a little longer in surgery in this Japanese study, which is interesting considering how thin the patients are. And another area, I, I don't perform HIPEC, but my HPB surgeons perform it, and, and others that I uh, perform. Excuse me one second. Sorry, just got to deal with the patient issue. Um, intraoperative peritoneal metastasis assessment. So if you're going to be doing a targeted peritonectomy, uh, metastectomy, and uh, maybe HIPEC, how are you going to do it? Right now it's the naked eye, but we can do better. And there's seven series now in which ICG has been used to guide uh, surgery for peritoneal carcinomatosis, you can see sensitivity and specificity aren't grand, but the intervention changed in 25% and 29% of patients uh, retrospect, uh, respectively based on ICG use. 
Um, here's another one. Look at the number of lesions analyzed, sensitivity, specificity, and what really matters is the change. So you're finding positive predictive value 77% and scars of 57%. Uh, again, going back to Antonio Lacy and, and his group in, in Barcelona, Spain, um, I intravenous. So, so this is a little bit different administration. This is intravenous, but 12 hours prior to surgery, which is very different than what we do for perfusion assessment, where it's within 60 seconds intravenous during surgery. This is more like the gallbladders for common duct, which is in the holding area prior to surgery. This one's 12 hours. So each one's a little different. And they detected that fluorescence of more than 181 units might be the threshold for malignancy with the following sensitivities and specificities. And uptake less than 100 units is benign. So they actually are able to find a break point. Along the lines of HPB surgery, as I mentioned, along with metastases, um, you have endocyanin green fluorescence imaging to guide liver resection. So this uh, article from Italy evaluated 13 previously published studies using a dose of uh, 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram between one day and two weeks prior to surgery. Imaging was all over the map, but intraoperative ultrasound was very high correlation, weighted average 96%. Uh, and it allowed detection of what we would call occult hepatic metastases. So lesions we didn't know were there, or they didn't know were there, are able to be detected, which is the difference between somebody having uh, recur so-called recurrent liver metastases. It's not really recurrent. It's just that they weren't treated because nobody knew they were there. So uh, detecting these occult hepatic metastases can really change prognosis. Um, so again, here, similar kind of a study from China, more metastases were identified, and I'm not sure why, but the hospital stay was less. I am fairly convinced that the one-year local recurrence rate, well, local in the liver, was lower because those occult hepatic metastases were identified and treated. And then in the UK, 15 patients, 77% of the lesions were detected by ultrasound, but when you added ICG to ultrasound, you get 90%, 90%. So the intraoperative strategy changed in almost half of patients. Again, these occult hepatic metastases can be treated. In, in my practice, what I do is I have ICG uh, uh, in the uh, ureteric catheters, and you can see the ureter coming into view. And then I'll pick my transition point, like we discussed in the last lecture, based upon ICG guidance, so I know where I'm going to do my resection margin. So the ICG is in the ureters. This is now transanally looking at a very low anastomosis, so we're looking at the mucosa. Here's an anoscope up top. Here's the mucosa below. So I look at ureters. Uh, I look at perfusion. I would urge everybody who has and who operates in virtually any area of the body to become familiar with ICG because this is one of the most rapid burgeoning uh, fields we have in surgery. This is a special issue of surgery, uh, which I'm uh, one of the chief. Uh, and you can see here we have a consensus conference. This one is discussing thyroid and parathyroid surgery, lymphatic surgery, cholecystectomy, gastric cancer surgery, colorectal surgery, uh, plastic and reconstructive surgery, uh, and then other surgical fields. So there's many, many ICG. Uh, that overall consensus was a two-round online Delphi survey, 35 international experts listed here. So you can see people from uh, Israel, from Italy, from Ireland, from Germany, Canada, UK, UK, uh, Egypt, France, China, uh, Belgium, Greece, US, uh, Belgium, Spain, um, and so on down the list, uh, all, all over the place, uh, Japan and, and, and Argentina, people participating and from all different fields of surgery that are all colorectal surgeons. And we had 69 statements, and you can see tremendous consensus um, in many, if not most, of the important statements, which is why I say that ICG is becoming mainstay of surgical therapy. So I wanted to familiarize you with it. I know you like videos, but this one is um, 
really more fact than, than video. We'll go back to more video next month, but I, I just wanted to get across just how valuable ICG is in, in surgical practice, regardless of one's specialty. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. It was fantastic talk about ICG. Dr. Bhalla, is there any question from the student side? Any question from any of you? Prof, I have one question that sometime when we use ICG, then sometime, you know, it, it creates false green all around. How to, how to remove that? Because sometimes, although we are setting the intensity, but then also sometimes surrounding structure also becomes green. So, Say, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with how much is injected and then the gain. Um, you know, you can play with the gain on these cameras, and I think if the gain is too high, everything turns green. Um, so you have to, I use the lowest possible uh, ga uh, gain that I can to see the fluorescence. The other thing is there's other settings you can use. So in addition to green, you can also use what's called the... Um, the spy mode. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The spy mode. And you could look at essentially it looks like a radiograph, an old fashioned x-ray, you know, and, and you can do the spy mode and, and then you can see the vessels. And that's another way to help resolve any conflict. By the way, I like your tie and uh, handkerchief combination. Pocket square. Very nice. Thank you, Prof. Another, I came to know that in USA, uh, they have started one association, means Society of Surgeons using fluorescent technology. Are you the you, member of any of that? Uh, say again. I'm sorry. They have started one, uh, you know, association of the fluorescence society that they oh, are. Yeah. Using. Right. Yes. Dr. Raul Rosenthal is the was the founder uh, of the uh, International Society for Fluorescence Guided Surgery, and that society meets. Um, annually here in, in Fort Lauderdale, plus usually a second time during the year somewhere else. In addition, there are various chapters. There's a UK chapter, there's a EU chapter, North American chapter, Latin American chapter, and there are individual meetings. So the Japanese this month, I believe, they may have just had it, uh, had a, a, a meeting there. The Argentinians just had a Latin American chapter. You are also member? Anybody can join. Okay. I think if you just look at ISFDS, anybody can join. It's, it's a wealth of material, uh, technical how-to videos, patient education videos, lectures you can download and use, news about what's happening, uh, all the different publications on ICG are housed there, so you've got a repository that you can go through. Okay, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much for your valuable time. Today also you are looking very handsome. Well, I don't, light... have a, I don't have a pocket square like you. That's pretty <laughs> flat. Light coming from the side on your face also looks fantastic. Oh, uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank Take you. care. See you next month. Bye. 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 So, there was no any question from all of you? So thank you very much. This was just a small talk he has taken on the ICG, especially for the you know use of colorectal. But today, as we have already discussed before, that there is no any surgery where nowadays ICG is not used. And I will look for the this International Fluorescent, Fluorescent Society, and then uh, I will try that we should also get make all of you as a member and uh, some member area will be created so that you can see how to use ICG on different gynae general surgical procedures. So thank you very much. Again, we will see you tomorrow. Have a nice evening. Thank you.